Our people now are clamoring for the Word. They want the Word preached. They love the Word of God. And they want it preached. And that's good. We went for many years in our church where so many of our people couldn't even hold a verse. You know, everything was programmed. Music, budgets, and stuff. <coughs> Not enough of the Word of God being preached. But there's been a, a, a return to the preaching of the Word. And it's getting more that way. And I'm thrilled that it is, aren't you? Praise the Lord. That reminds me, did you hear about the big service they had the other day and God came and didn't have any singing? <laughs> there's, a, there's a verse in the Bible that says, Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. It's out of the King James. And uh, it's always one lady said to me, he said, if, if the Apostle Paul used the King James, I think you fellas all use it. And I agree with it. But. <laughs> the Bible also says, As a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. But then if, the, if you just want to read it right out of the Greek, just pure old word for word, here's what it would say in the Bible. Have this same attitude in you which Jesus Christ had in him. And as I approach this service tonight, I couldn't get this verse off of my heart. Have this same attitude in you which Christ Jesus had in him. Rockefeller said once, he wasn't a homeless preacher, but he said the number one lesson all men must learn is the attitude and how to get along with one another. And we can accomplish this, we can somehow make it in life. And I believe among the homeless people that perhaps our number one problem is attitude. Now it may, it may enter into other areas. It may enter into gossip and giving a lot of other things but it all comes from the heart of the attitude is where it is so I hear the Lord saying tonight why don't you have this same attitude in you that Jesus Christ had in him and I'm going to preach tonight about a fellow who had a bad attitude there won't be anybody here that will need one thing I say because the congregation is made up of saints and I'm aware of that only saints go to church at night time <laughs> and many of you here tonight out of faithfulness because a lot of you feel like I do my two my two services I like the least I'm being honest with you you know the two services I like the least are watch night and sunrise <laughs> it's not the time of the day when I feel the most spiritual <laughs> and I have trouble getting blessed at 1130 at night I try but it's difficult <laughs> and I have trouble with sunrise services. Did you ever try to sing He Arose on a cold hillside at 5 o'clock in the morning? Especially if you have a bass voice, it's hard to do. Only saints are here tonight. But there'll be some things I'll say that you can tell the other layman about. They'll need it. You'll see them Sunday. <laughs> the rascal should have been here anyway. You can tell them what I said because it'll help them. <laughs> The 15th chapter of Luke is a very beautiful chapter. Love to preach from it, as you love to hear fellows preach from it. And the ladies, of course. The first story is about the lost coin and how she swept diligently until she found it. I'll never cease to marvel at how diligently the Holy Ghost is sweeping our world. Thank God. You preacher, don't forget he goes before you and comes along behind you. He's always there knocking the door before you get there and stays after you leave. Don't ever forget that. And then there is the story, of course, of the lost sheep and how the tender, loving shepherd found the lost sheep and had a meeting in the membership committee and put him on 12 months probation. <laughs> oh, don't you love it? <clears throat> but Jesus put him on his shoulders and he tenderly carried him home. That's the way we're supposed to do it. And then there's the story of the lost boy that was found. Beautiful story how a boy got out of the pig pen and went to the most tremendous bank which ever read about. What a graduation. What a transition. What is more marvelous tonight than the past from sin to grace, from hell to heaven, from misery to happiness, from the pig pen to the Father's house. It's a beautiful story. But then there is also the story of closing of the elder brother. Now I am not an elder brother preacher. I'm a prodigal son preacher. By nature, I preach better than a prodigal son. 
You see, when I preach on holiness and love and the cross and heaven and getting blessed, I do a good job. That's my nature. And that's when I can wax elephants and preach a little better. <laughs> but, but I never have been much for the elder brother because uh, that's not my preaching territory. And besides, it might upset somebody. I don't want to upset anybody, you know. <laughs> I want to go to heaven. When everybody can say, Brother Hoot was so good, never hit no nose. <laughs> I want to be like Uncle Bud said. He said, I saw a fellow one time, he reminded me of a deer. He said, a deer can have antlers four feet wide and run 30 miles an hour through a forest where trees are six inches apart and not knock the bark off the thing. <laughs> so I thought maybe I didn't preach on the elder brother, I wouldn't knock any bark off <laughs> In Luke 15 and verse 25. Now the elder brother was in the field. And that's a text in case you might wonder. That's the beginning of the whole story. To start with, he's where he didn't belong. You don't stay out in the field when the banquet's in the house. Now the elder brother was in the field. And as he came and grew nigh to the house, he got near but never got inside, you know. He heard music and singing and dancing. And he called one of the servants and asked what these things meant. Isn't that something? been in the church all of his life and didn't even know what a hallelujah meeting was. Isn't that amazing? Been there all the time and didn't have any, didn't want a T-bone steak for him. Our amazing grace. Our happy folk. He had been so busy with retreats and seminars and board meetings and pastor evaluations. that he hadn't figured out yet what a hallelujah banquet was. See, I told you, your friends had been here. <laughs> and he said unto him, Thy brother is come. See the carnality in that? Later. Not in this, but later. The servant said, Your, your brother is come. But later, this fellow said to his dad, he said, Your son's got here. The servant tried to tell him his brother was home, he wouldn't accept it. But later he said, Dad, is that your boy here? Feel the carnality in that? How sneaky, negative. Let's read on. <clears throat> and he said unto him, Thy brother is come, and thy father hath killed a fatted calf, because he hath received him safe and sound. And he was angry, not righteously indignant, not upset, but angry, and would not go in. Therefore came his father out and entreated him, or begged him, or knelt on his knees and pled with him. And he answering said to his father, Lo, these many years do I serve thee. Neither transgressed I at any time thy commandment. What a good man. He sounds just like a good Wednesday night testimony, doesn't it? Doesn't it sound good? Anybody here, if you give the same one for the last 25 years, you might try this one. This is a nice one. <laughs> I'm all welled up tonight already. <laughs> I'm probably the happiest guy you'll ever have preached to you. <laughs> and he answered and said to his father, Lo, these many years do I serve thee. Neither transgressed I at any time thy commandment. He said, I've been the perfect layman. There's never been a more perfect layman in the church than I've been. In fact, Kansas City said I was one of the best churchmen they knew about. And yet you gave me not a kid that I might make merry with my friends. But as soon as this thy son was coming, which hath devoured thy living with prostitutes, thou hast killed for him the fatted calf. And he said unto him, Son, thou art ever with me, and all that I have is thine. Isn't that good? It was meet that we should make merry and be glad. For this thy brother was dead and is alive again. He was lost and he is found. And this man who was such a good man missed it because his attitude was bad. Let's look in on him tonight. There might be something you haven't thought about yet. There are two kinds of sins in the scriptures. And either group is black and dirty and damnable and you're lost over them. One, of the, one group are the sins of the flesh like adultery and lying and stealing and Sabbath desecration and so on and so forth. The other group of sins are sins of the Spirit. Sins like pride and covetousness and lust and envy 
and anger and gluttony <laughs> and strife and slothfulness. The Bible says to be fervent in spirit, serving the Lord. So this elder brother was guilty of the sins of the spirit. Now, the first thing that got him in trouble was his feeling of self-importance. Did you know that's going around the country these days a, a, a new theology? You hear a lot on TV especially that you can sort of just think yourself into being a little God. You don't have to pray. It doesn't depend on what the Scriptures say. It doesn't depend on the flow of the Holy Ghost. You just think it just right and it'll happen any minute. It sounds good, but it's not scriptural. It's not of God. But he felt that he was terribly important. He complained that nobody gave him a party. Now, he wasn't opposed to parties. They were just having a party for the wrong fella. <laughs> he said, nobody gave me a party. He wasn't opposed to parties. They just had it for the wrong guy. Self-importance, you know. I love me. I love me. I love me. Except to death. I love myself so much I put a 16 by 20 picture on the shelf. And see, he loved himself, eating up with self-importance. He said, all these many years have I served thee. All these many years I transgressed not thy law. I helped build this church. My mother was missionary president. Nobody's in it better than I am. I double tithe last year. Nobody's had a party for me. <laughs> Feeling of self-importance. And then he was eaten up with self-pity. He felt sorry for himself. I remember when I was a little kid, my mother used to play a song and sing it. My mother's here tonight, and she sang a lot of that worldly music to me, but I managed to overcome it. <laughs> <laughs> I know back in the 1930s and 40s, I was a kid, she sang a lot of that Suffer Creek rock that she ought not to sum to me, but she did. But one of them was, nobody loves me, everybody hates me, come let's go and eat some worms. <laughs> Long, slim, slimy worm, big, fat, juicy worm, and all kinds of a bitty, woolly worm. <laughs> Maybe that's what this fellow should have done, but he felt sorry for himself. He said, all these years I've served you, and nobody has given me a cat. And he was eaten up with self-pity. There isn't one of us in this room that we really wanted to couldn't sit down and feel sorry for ourselves and talk ourselves into backslide. There's not a person in this room hadn't had a raw deal out of somebody last year. But big deal. We're not to heaven yet. That's part of being down here by the McCormick. That's part of life. That's part of living. Don't suck your thumb and be a little kid about it, but grow up. It's fun to grow up. The Apostle Paul said in his New Year sermon, he said, this one thing I do, forgetting those things that are behind, I press forward toward the prize for the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. What did Paul have to put behind anyway? I think he tried to come here tonight and preach and be the Apostle Paul. Think what happened when he got to preach on. Think about it. A lady sitting there that he had murdered her husband. Somebody else sitting there that he said, your sins are buried as far as the east is from the west. Who wants to dig up an old dead body that's already been buried? Only buzzards and gossipers dig up dead bodies. <laughs> buried, forgotten as far as the east is from the west and the sea of God's forgetfulness, Paul said. And this is my New Year sermon. I'm not going to feel sorry for myself, Paul said. I will bury it and cover it up and get myself a brand new beginning and a fresh new start. Amen. Wouldn't it be great on this New Year's night if God the Holy Ghost would give all of us a brand new touch and a brand new start Amen. and a brand new beginning just sort to start all over. Praise the Lord. Amen. A brand new start for Jesus. A new revival. A new beginning. Now... The story closes with the elder brother still on the outside. As I prepared this sermon tonight, I think, Phil, that was a thing that got to me more than anything else. <clears throat> after all the story, and after all the years in the church, when we come to the last verse, he's still on the outside. You know what troubles me tonight? Folk who join the church, that are really in the church, membership-wise, and never <coughs> up spiritually, 
very few of those people ever sell and make a drastic <laughs> spiritual change in their life. Well, we get accustomed to being dry-eyed and stiff-kneed and cold-hearted and set in the same way the same time every week, year after year. Very few of those people ever make a drastic spiritual change mm -hmm. because they get used to it right. and they're content and they're in the rut and never make an effort to get out. I'm going to make a statement tonight that I wouldn't have made as a young preacher because I'd have gotten trouble over it in May anyhow. Of course, I'm old enough now I can eat up for seven and catch enough jackrabbits to get home on. I just sort of <laughs> say whatever I think I ought to say. But, and this may shake you up. And I said because I love you and I love our sign tonight. I don't know what the percentage would be, but I'm firmly convinced that traveling our church tonight, that the majority of our people, laymen and are getting more religious and less spiritual. That's why our churches aren't growing. That's why our pews are We're getting more and more religious and less and less spiritual. <coughs> He was a son, but he wasn't a brother. He was a father's son, but he wasn't a brother. The Bible says, don't say you love me that you haven't seen when you don't love those that you have seen. And we have around the church a lot of cute little spiritual cliches that makes us feel good. They sort of ease our conscience. And one of them is, I've treated everybody just the same. <laughs> you know in your heart it's not so. Because we don't do it. And Jesus said, when they come to church, don't say to one man, you sit up here. Another man, you sit down here. Would we honestly treat the alcoholic with the same respect we would the multimillionaire that comes to double tide? Would we honestly treat the lady from the project the same way we treat the man who has a government position in the county? Do we treat all men the same? Do we treat our enemies as well as the man who's better to us than anybody in the world? Many of us are sons, but we're not brothers. We don't treat the family right. And he said, he said, thy brother has come home. And because his attitude toward his brother, it strained his relationship with his father. It's not right between God and us when it's not right between us and someone else. That's just the way it works. Now, let's move on tonight a little bit farther. He served faithfully but not in fellowship. He was faithful, but not in fellowship. He never missed a day, never missed a service, lived a good life, but he was out of fellowship all the time. The joy wasn't there. The thrill wasn't there. The romance wasn't there. Did you know that rock artists get more excited over a concert than we do a homeless revival? The milk and honey was his. The steaks were his. It was all his. But while he was an artist so much, yet he was so poor with no joy and no liberty. Right. Now let me stop and preach a minute longer here. I'm gonna, I may catch a fish if I fish up this creek. And let's go up this one while. Just stop for a minute and think about the people you know. Now just don't, don't say them out loud for heaven's sake. We'll have massive confusion here. <laughs> Talk about telling things out loud. I decided maybe that when I die, I'm going to preach my own funeral, put it on the tape. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm going to tell everything I know. <laughs> <laughs> now you told about a well-attended funeral, folks. <laughs> <laughs> I mean to tell you, <laughs> Kansas City will be in an uproar. You wait and see. I'm going to well, <laughs> so let's get back to serious stuff. Think for a minute about all the people that you know. Now, now be honest now. Just, just don't say it out loud. But how many people do you know that it's really a joy to be around? You can't hardly wait to see them. Now we're getting down to where the pavement meets the road. How many folk in your local church do you just go all week and say, boy, I get to see them Sunday? Oh, boy, I can't hardly wait. They'll meet me at the door. Glory to God, this is our big day. Wow, I can't wait to see him. We got so many folks like that. Yeah, of course you yeah. <laughs> have. How many really positive friends do you have tonight? How many folks do you know that you can't hardly wait to see and be around? That should tell us something. Many of us are certain negative people have to pray to say hello to us. And you ever notice when you're pastors, you've always got one in the church. There's always one. 
And they always do it. Now, you're an old timer, Owen. You're the oldest fellow here tonight. And, and you know what I'm talking about. But did you know that there's always one, every church, and they always do it under the guise of being spiritual. Did you ever notice that? The, the cover says, I'm the most spiritual one in the church. And they say, now understand I'm not a gossiping. It's just I'm so concerned about our church. You know what's going on, don't you? <laughs> and the part the and the pitiful thing about it is that the person that's shallow spiritually don't see that they say, Oh, isn't she a saint or he's a saint? They're so concerned about church. Probably been in prayer. No, they ain't been in prayer. They wouldn't know what a prayer meeting was. People pray don't yak that away. People that pray come on smiling and rejoicing. And they're positive when they pray. You don't come out of the prayer meeting negative and depressing. You see, we went through a period in, in, in the church, and I'm not knocking that. God knows I'm not. But I've been around a long time. Went through a period in the church back there when the, the meaner you looked, the more spiritual you were. You if you looked real sour, it meant you probably prayed all night. <laughs> and folks never realized maybe somebody might have indigestion. They weren't spiritual. <laughs> I like what Jesus said. He said, after you fast and pray, He said, wash your face. And look happy and don't try to act spiritual. When I first started out preaching, I was going to try to really impress them. And my first revival, I said, folk, I prayed all night last night. After service, a kind old white-haired man, God bless him, he bailed me out. He, gave up, he said, son, you take advice? I said, sure I do. I'm going to try to be a good preacher and I'm open to advice. He said, all right, I'm going to lay one on you then. You better listen to me. He said, if you ever pray all night, you won't have to announce it. We'll know it. Quit trying to act spiritual. <laughs> Well, one of the big drawbacks of church growth and kingdom building is just the lack of positive people. <clears throat> Think of having to live in a home if somebody's negative. A husband or wife or dad or mom is negative. Do you think how miserable folk would be if trying to live with somebody like that 24 hours a day with a negative person? I don't care how good they are otherwise. Can you imagine a layman getting stuck with a negative preacher? And have to put up with him three times a week. I've seen them. I'm with them all the time. I know who they are. <laughs> we work all week long in revival. Come up to Sunday morning. This is a big day, boy. This morning's it. God's going to help us. And he gets up and takes five minutes to fuss because the Sunday school is down three over last Sunday. Big deal, whether it is or isn't. Can you see a great pastor? My brother. What's his name at First Baptist in Dallas? Or the guy at First Methodist down in Houston? Or somebody like that taking 10 minutes out of the Sunday morning service trying to yak about three or four up or down in Sunday school. No wonder we don't get anything. Fish in shallow waters. That's why we don't catch anything. We deal in kids stuff. Nobody cares whether it's up or down three or four. Nobody cares. What does it matter? It's why we get done over the whole year that counts. Not what we did today. We're building the kingdom. We're going to get it done. God's a helping us. We're His church. We're His people. We're going to get it done. Let's don't be negative as preachers and laymen. Let's don't have negative board meetings and negative testimony meetings and negative song services and negative Sunday school classes. The fellow said to me, said, Brother, what should be done with a Sunday school teacher that permits gospel in his Sunday school class? I said he ought to be fired. No later than today. <laughs> Don't you wish they'd have been here? Oh, they should have been. You've got friends that need this, lots of them. <laughs> How many people do you know are really positive? I've been praying like this, Pastor Ron. I've been saying, Lord, when I go to revival, let me be positive enough that if I can't preach a lick, I mean if I can't say a word, that just being there, I'll be worth what they'll pay me. Just being there, you know. I've been a few places. I've been worth what they'll pay me if I had to go. But I said, Lord, 
<laughs> just, let, <laughs> just let me be positive enough. Let me be so positive while I'm there that I can prop up that pastor and prop up those ladies and encourage those people. And if I didn't say a word, just my being there would be worth the effort of that revival meeting. It's not just words, brethren. It's our attitude that counts. That's where you drive down the state. We influence others. They pick up on us. By the way, preachers, your sheep will graze in whatever pasture you take them to. Let me move on. I've just tried so hard here. The Lord knows I'm doing my best. And so far, I haven't found anybody that's needed anything. Let me just preach on some more. <laughs> Negative. You see, he got trouble because his attitude was negative. That's what happened to the elder brother. He was so negative. You see, the negative person just always says, Well, now I've looked at this and it can't be done. You see, the bumblebee is not supposed to fly. Because you understand, Richard, that those who study aerodynamics says his wings are not big enough to carry his body. But nobody's told the bumblebee yet, so he just fly. You know, because the Lord pushed him off the pad and away he goes. You see, they say you can't fly backwards. It's against the laws of nature and nobody can fly backwards. But nobody's told the hummingbee, hummingbird. So he flies 30 mile an hour backwards. You can't even catch him and him going backwards. A 200 pound man with healthy legs can't catch a hummingbird that long and him and fly backwards. Because God has control and God runs a motor and God pushes it backwards. It's getting to high time among the holiness folk that we quit trying to evaluate it all and figure it all out and say, this, I'm going to decide what we're going to do. It's high time in our church. We let God do the flying and God do the pushing and God do the planning and let God take charge and let God do it again for us like it was in the old days. Glory be to God. Look at David and Goliath. Goliath came out and said, all right, you holiness people, like we'll be the one of them. Anybody want to fight? And they all very meekly said, we can't fight, we're sanctified. <laughs> he wasn't so sanctified that we're scared to death. But they had one little guy that saved the day, David. He was fresh off the farm. Thank the Lord for the fresh and the farm folk. They've bailed us out of many a time. He was fresh in the farm. He hadn't been to a seminar, or assembly, or retreat, or nothing. He just got in from the farm. <laughs> He hadn't even learned the four spiritual laws yet. He just got there. That's why he fought Goliath. He didn't know any better. He'd be out there with the Lord, out on the hillside, tending sheep, praying, getting blessed, walking with the Lord. He, he hadn't found out yet you wasn't supposed to fight giants. And David said, Lord, let me have it. I'd love to have this easy job. It's such an easy job. Everybody else said he is so big. And David said, thank you, Lord, that he's so big. I'm going to kill him with a slingshot. I can't miss a fella that size. Thank you, Lord. You're so good to me. I can't miss him. No way can I miss him. If a little fella, I might miss him. Then he'd beat me half to death. But, Lord, you give me a big guy. Thank you, Lord. Wham! And got him. He's dead as a doornail. I heard Dr. Powers preaching one time. He got all wound up. He said, David just cut Goliath's head off and shook it in his face. <laughs> That's hard to do. <laughs> you see his only attitude. Here's a whole crowd saying he's too big, and David says he's just the right size. Let me get on with it, Lord. He's going to be an easy target. Thank you, Lord. I tell you, folks, it's in the attitude. You know what faith is? It's what we can't do without God. And most of our churches tonight, everything we're doing, just about all of it, we can do if there wasn't any God around. It's just a little old stuff that we can do it ourselves anyhow. Wouldn't it be great to take God in, stretch our faith, let God take over, and undertake some big things for God in our day? <coughs> Beethoven was deaf and burdened with sorrow when he wrote the greatest works you've ever heard. John Bunyan was in prison when he wrote Pilgrim's Progress. Paul was locked up in jail when he said, Rejoice always in the Lord. And again, I say rejoice. It's in the attitude. Glory be to God. That's where it is. It's all in the attitude. You see, the principle of the slight edge, that's where it is. Everybody listen just a moment now. This is good stuff right here. It 
really is. I want you to get it. The difference in two men is the slight edge of the attitude. You have two late in the church. They got converted about the same time. Same two type guys, but one of them's a soul winner, exuberant prayer warrior, and all those things. And the other one can't, can't seem to get off the ground. But if you'll study those two men, it's in their attitude. A professor at Preston Seminary did a study on all the graduate students they had preacher boys through the years. He discovered that the few preachers that really got it done were the ones that were so happy that they smiled a lot, had such a good positive attitude, that they somehow got through situations that other men couldn't get through. <coughs> the slight edge is the attitude. Let me say something else before I go on here. I've been with fellows in revivals. <clears throat> this is not picket preachers night, by the way. And I'm not going to roast anybody. We're just talking here. But I've been in revival meetings. I announced on Friday night we have a prayer meeting next morning at 6 on Saturday morning. After service, I say to the pastor, how many do you think we'll have? Two. I said, well, how do you know we'll have two? I'm the preacher here, ain't I? I know everybody in my church. I said, who will those two be? You and me. Who you reckon? <laughs> I said, well, I think we'll have 35. 35. Oh, that'll be the day. We go to prayer meeting, we have 35. And fellas, I don't know why I came, but who's just got so excited about it, he made it look good to us. Well, I thought, man, I can't miss this. This is the best thing we've ever had. I couldn't wait to get here. I thought 35. I got excited about it, and we had 35. You know what the devil's done to us? He's taken us with our high standards and our godly lives, and he has driven nails in the coffin of our faith. And it's tied us down and held us down and made us think little. We've almost buried ourselves with little thinking. This is our little group, nice and clean, big as we need to be. We're doing fine. It pleased God the last day of this year to break every shackle off of us that's held us down and let our faith blossom out and let praise and rejoicing take over and start reaching our neighbors and filling our pews and having great all the services and getting on with it. But it's in the attitude. <coughs> now, as I close tonight, I don't mean a thing that this means as I move from my first point to the second. In conclusion, <laughs> in my 30-minute conclusion, there's a few more things I want to say. <laughs> it took him so long to learn such a little. He was in the church all the time, at the Father's house. But it took him so long to learn such a little. We have such a poor spiritual appetite tonight as God's people. I've been eating his word of late. And just been like milk and honey to the marrow of my bone. And how it does fatten and fill my soul. But it took him so long to learn such a little till he found himself saying, what do these things mean? Oh, he could raise the soybeans. He could plow the corn, take care of the cattle. Run that thing just like that, man. Knew all about the church. Didn't know what it was for a brother to get saved. Or to have a hallelujah banquet. Or have music and rejoicing. He couldn't seem to be a part of that. The fellow said to me, I don't believe the same the same verse twice, just trying to work up something. <laughs> and I said, Well, I'm going to tell you something. And I said, You tell all your old dried up pruned friends the same thing I'm telling you. I said, I read in Revelation. Where they had 120 fellows leading the singing. Every time they got blessed, they sang the same verse again. Glory and dominion and majesty and power and glory now forevermore, world without end. Amen and amen. And that's how you fellows going to handle that. You're going to tell them to quit. I read in Isaiah where he said, Stir yourselves up and take hold of God. Amen. And if they can have cheerleaders trying to get a ball through a hook, how come we can't have some spiritual cheerleaders around the church? Some positive folks that get blessed and excited and just sings right out. I don't care if you sing out of tune for heaven's sake. Somebody sing. I mean sing the veins stand out in your neck. Say a hearty amen. Get excited about it. This is the best thing in the world. Let's get back to being old time Nazarenes again. And get blessed again. And have revival again. And with our neighbors again. And fill the building up again. And get on with it again. If you're in favor of that, say amen. Amen. Lord. Glory to Jesus. He was so near, but yet he was so far. He was in the field, right too near to the house, looking in the window. 
close he ever got just staring in the window. I invite you tonight, if you're going to go to heaven on the old gospel train to go first class, you've been the caboose long enough. Get up there in the family car. Get up there where you belong. Go first class. Praise God. If you're going to pray and give the money and pay the bills, you just well to have some of the milk and honey on the journey and be right up front for Jesus. But he was so near and yet so far. He was so concrete that it couldn't be pliable. He could have said, well, this looks good. <laughs> I've always wanted to go to a banquet like that. Maybe I should go inside and see what it's like. Maybe I, I should be glad my brother's home. I know he might get my place on the church board, but I'm going to risk it. <laughs> I know I've been on the board for 23 years, and it's touch and go because he's a, he's a sharp young guy. He's got personality. He could get me voted right off. <laughs> But I'm so glad he got saved and people go in and say hello to him anyway. And invite him in. I said he was jealous of him. Watched through the window. I said, look at him in there getting blessed. Brand new Christian. I've been in this church all these years as faithful as I can be. He ain't good at Nazarene. He's brand new. He don't know what it's all about. Everybody still loves me. Hold up your right hand. <laughs> Everybody's glad I came tonight over right here and don't tell a lie. <laughs> well, I'm with them quite a bit. <laughs> he was so faithful, but it was not refreshing. I've been reading a lot about the churches in Revelation. And he said to one church, because you're neither cold nor hot. And I've preached all my life about that cold or hot. And I said, now, Lord, I haven't been preaching it right. There's something that I haven't found yet. But there's better truth than I've been preaching and he got looking in on it. And see, they didn't have their own water supply. And had to bring the water in. I mean, up north and down south. The water up north is cold and refreshing and good to drink. The water from the south they got was therapeutic and healing, like Hot Springs, Arkansas. They had the choice of water. So God said to that church, and he knew what water was about. He said, because you are neither healing nor refreshing, I will spew thee out of my mouth. And so many of our services... Don't heal the wounds and refresh the soul. It's the same old thing every Sunday. Week after week, week after week. If you go there all the time, you can take a nap every Sunday and never miss a lick because you know what they're going to do next. It's always two songs and a prayer, another song, <laughs> and the offering, and the special, and the message, and a dry to call and come back next Sunday and bring somebody with you. And it's not healing. And it's not refreshing. Wouldn't it be great in 1987 to have an outpouring, a glorious outpouring of therapeutic healing from heaven and great refreshing Holy Ghost waters to flow over our souls and over our services and just ignite us again with victory and joy and excitement and thrill and romance among the people of God. He was so good, but he wasn't tender. See, this is where the devil is licking us, boys. Good people, but no tears. Precious people, but their hearts aren't broken. We have little sick revivals anymore. And excuse ourselves, you know. And Monday morning, we say, well, we had a right good need. The crowds were small. Nobody much at the altar, but he preached in the church. He was a good man, just what we need. And we excuse ourselves and try to blot out our consciousness. Wait and try it again. You know what's the truth? You know I'm preaching the truth. You see, we don't like to face these things. It's better to bury your head in the sand. You know what else we're doing? We're giving aspirin to spiritual cancer. It's not weak. We have to look at ourselves. Just look ourselves square in the face and say, we've had enough of this. We're going to rise up and get out of the rut and get on with it. God's going to help us and we're going to get it done. He was so good, but he wasn't tender. If we just get back to tears again and broken hearts again. I'm like Solomon. I am weary of beautiful words. You know, in our church, I don't care what you need is, I can fly in next expert. You know what I mean? Now, he, he never did it himself when he was in the work, but he can tell you that. And no matter what the need is, you can have one flown in. And he can tell you how to do it. Just like that. 
one? I want to tell you something, folks. Only God knows the need where you live. Only God knows the need in your church where you worship. Only God knows your benefits. Only the Holy Ghost knows the true answer right now. Wouldn't it be great if God could just break our hearts up again? We could weep and pray and get back on track and get a soul encompassing burden until somehow we reach those that we love so much tonight. Now he was angry. Which literally means in the Greek they had a fallen countenance. He was sulky and he was powerful. He said, the church hasn't done me. He brought this new guy in here and had a bank for him. And I had to stand outside and watch the good women have paper. And his face got long and he was sulky. I want to ask you a question before I finish here tonight. And I want somebody to explain it to me. I just asked this night, the kid, I'm still asking. How is the people have sanctified hearts, spirit-filled lives, and long faces. Has anybody figured that out yet? How come they're happier here in the water than they are at home in the church? Has anybody got that figured out yet? Am I off track? Am I, am I off track? A little bit, maybe? We're not going to win the world unless we win them with happiness. The best advertising we've got, spirit filled people out there with happy faces. That's where advertising is. That's what's going to win them. That's the best we've got. I went to Grand Ole Opry and I was in Rebecca High School. Back then it was against the law to go. You know, they throw you out of school when went to Grand Ole Opry. My roommate and me went and they would have thrown us out. They had the meeting to decide whether to throw us out or not. And my roommate got us out of it. He told them we were down there passing out tracks. <laughs> <laughs> I remember how these pictures say, God bless you boys, and my roommate said, he does. <laughs> but those fellas got up there in those cowboy boots, you know, and they wouldn't own a cow from a horse or most of them and had those shirts unbuttoned down to their belt and three, four chains around their neck. <clears throat> Looked like a youth minister revival right just was. <laughs> anyway, they get up there and prop themselves up in them boots and take that guitar, and everyone played the key of C and sang a half a step off through their nose, every one of them. And they sang for four hours, one half a step off through their nose, and sang the same song for four hours. Oh, they had different titles, but every song was the same one. I loved you, baby, but you're gone from me now. And they'd sing about their baby being gone for four hours, and that crowd cheered. And laughed and cried, ate popcorn, bought records, spent their last penny, had a time of life. For four hours, we'd be getting some poor old sinner saved and preach about the blood of Jesus. And if it gets a quarter to twelve, they've been there for 45 minutes, to shake their watches, ask the neighbor what time it is. <laughs> well, I close with this. He said to the elder brother something you should have already thought about. He said, before you suck and pout in long, can I remind you of two things? He said, have you not been with me all the time? We forget sometimes that we've been around all the time. We've been here for a long time. <clears throat> when you get the age I am, you, you become more and more honest as a preacher. You don't play games anymore. You just sort of tell it like you did. Let me just, this is very personal. I never said this a little bit. I stay, I stay terribly concerned about myself. You see, at the age of 54, see, I could, I could creep my way in, just hobble on in. Couldn't I? Sure I could. I don't have to have any revival. I don't have to weep or bend my soul or break my heart anymore. I could just sort of, the people I know, the experiences I've had, the places I've been, what little bit of talents I've got, put all this stuff together, and I could just sort of, Get into retirement. Get that little check and sit on the creek bank and fish and say, don't do it like I did. That's what the matter with it. And just barely get into heaven. You know I could. A lot of folk are. All of our precious preachers and lady, the older they get, the more they're letting up and being spiritually oppressed. And folks, the devil is not going to treat me. I'm going to stay young and <laughs> my heart is. 
I'm going to pray through when that sun comes up. That day I will touch him sometime in prayer that day. I'm going to preach better. Be a better father. A better family man. A better neighbor. A better Christian. A better churchman. A better preacher. And day by day, I'm going to grow in grace. And get happier every day I live. And enjoy my religion. And go to heaven triumphantly. Not just barely get in with a skin of a tea. Have the same attitude in you which Jesus Christ had in him. You didn't run well. What did hinder you? The Bible said, remember Lot's wife. It's the end of the year. Don't look back. You know, it said, just get out and go. Told Lot to take your wife and flee out of Sodom. Lot's wife turned to a pillow of salt. I don't know what happened to the flea. But anyway, there stands there a pillar of white salt as a monument to those who would look back. And the Bible says, look back over the plow handle, do not worry to be mine. Let's bury the defeat of 1986 and then begin a brand new year. We can't make anybody do anything, but we can get ourselves on track in 1987 and make this the best year of our life. Praise the Lord. I preach too long. I love these one service uh, deals like this. I just love them. You just preach as long as you want to. If they don't come back tomorrow night, it won't matter. Ain't nobody will be here no minute. <laughs> <laughs> they want to sit home tomorrow night. I ain't going tonight. I just preach half a night. Like nobody cares. <laughs> There's a verse over there in Romans I've had on my mind all day. I want you folks to take it home with you tonight. He said, Be not overcome with evil, but overcome evil with good. And the literal translation would go like this. Be so full of the good that there is no room for the evil. So the end of 1986, let's have an old-fashioned house cleaning in our soul. In the bedroom, and the attic, and the cellar, and every place. And let's take out every little trace of self-pity, and self-importance, and pouty, and sulkiness, and bad attitudes, and stinginess, and littleness, and all this stuff that empowers the work of the Lord. And let's just take it all out. Then say, now Lord, fill me full of the Holy Ghost and God. Till He just comes back and just stuffs us full of holiness, and heaven, and victory, and power. And then there's no room for this stuff to stop with the work of God. Let this attitude be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. Let's stand together. Thank you.